I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. Some of you may know me, um, but uh, so I, my background is in Java. I've been doing Java since before it was Java, since '95 or so, uh, when I was a project at Sun called Oak. Uh, back then, I was very much interested in Android, in um, sorry, in Java for embedded devices. Uh, but then, what happened is J Java mostly evolved in the enterprise computing. So for the pa past 10, 15 years, that's basically what I've been doing mostly enterprise web development. Uh, with Java, and then a couple of years ago when Android came out, um, I got really interested in that. Uh, so that's sort of my uh, my background. I, over the past two years, I've been extensively uh, working on Android projects, doing a lot of training. Um, so I've, uh, this year alone, that's my statistics I've done, and actually it's kind of outdated, but I've done close to 200,000 miles uh, this year. I've been on the road probably 100 and 70, 80 days, something like that, uh, crisscrossing the globe and doing doing a lot of classes for companies like Qualcomm, Motorola, Sony Ericsson, Department of Defense, um, you know, Cisco lately as well. And um, I also often speak at conferences. Um, so I spoke at OSCON a couple of times, ACM, IEEE. Um, I'm speaking at the upcoming and DevCon, Android Developer Conference, which is in San Mateo uh, in March. And, uh, and I'm also working on Learning Android. It's a book that's going to be published by O'Reilly. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that book uh, because the, the, the book is actually came out of this five-day class. So I've done this class many, many, many times um, and probably over, to over thousands of people. And I sort of saw th certain things work and certain things don't work. So over time, I kind of try to distill it down into a book. So, so, um, and that book is currently available um, online at, if you go to learning-android.com, that's going to forward you to another URL. But uh, it, that's a good start. So learning-android.com. And a lot of what you guys have in, in your material... It, well, it's sort of, uh, sort of that. Um, you know, this is you can think of it as a rough draft. It's still going to get edited for language and all that other stuff. So, learning that Android, learning dash Android .com. So right now it's free. Um, it's in a draft version, and uh, it's in this format where people can comment. So you can just go and comment on it as well. So if you see something that's wrong or you know something that could be improved on, you can just do it there. So that's um, that's just a little bit about that book. Um, you know, it's all available here and so on. So far, so good. Okay, cool. So, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're gonna do today. So we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about the stack. Um, you know, what Android is and what it isn't. We're gonna do a little hello world example, um, and then we're gonna talk probably around lunchtime or right after lunch but the main building blocks that's something that I think is uh, sort of uh, very important and new in Android so after that we are going to talk about user interface and that's what we're probably going to spend most of the rest of the day on so that's sort of our plan for for today um, th this initial part here is going to be somewhat more theoretical uh, but that's just kind of how we're going to start. Don't worry, this is going to be very much a hands-on class, so it's not so much a theory. Um, and the way that, the way that we're going to do it is um, I'm going to walk you through an example. I'll actually be doing it live, and then you guys are going to be doing something similar yourself. Um, and then in the last hour, we'll give you a chance to actually work on a totally different project knowing what you picked up in the class so far. Sounds good? Um, and I know some of you might have seen some parts of this because you took the um, the overview, which is essentially the first day of the five-day class. Cool. So, and f by the way, feel free to ask questions at any point in time. It's a, it's a small class, so feel free to, you know, it's your class. So ask whatever you want to know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the stack. How many of you have seen this before? A couple of you? Okay, um, so it's basically the, the you know the, the stack of the entire operating system. Um, Android is, as you know, a full-fledged 
platform. It's got everything we need to, to get going. So what we're going to do is we're going to start top up, I mean bottom up. We're going to talk a little bit about Linux. We're going to talk about the native libraries, Dalvik, the app framework, and finally we're going to discuss applications. So that's sort of our goal for, for now. So as you know, um, at the bottom of it all, it's, it's basically a Linux. So Android is based on Linux operating system. Um, what, um, any ideas why Linux? Uh, I said because uh, one open, uh, okay. a couple of years of proven uh, use, you know, so. So it's open? Yeah, and proven use, I mean, if you had to go write that OS from scratch, you can do a lot of debugging and yeah. serious investment. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's open and it works, right? Yeah. Any other ideas why, why Linux? So security, yeah, yeah. It's it's it is an operating system that's been in a very harsh environment. So we know a lot about Linux security, and that uh, you know dovetails into you know it's an open platform. So we know uh, we know what that is. Um, another thing that I would um, also mention is that Linux uh, we 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 understand the driver model on Linux very well. So it's relatively easy to port it. Right. So when when Android started as a project, um, Eric Schmidt basically said, "Look, our you know our goal is not to have G phone because a lot of people ba back then thought, oh, Google's working on a G phone, right? iPhone G phone, right? And they made it clear right then and there that's not the goal, right? The goal is to have a platform that's going to run on a zillion different devices, and you, you're going to see how this decision kind of um, is implemented throughout." various parts of software as a platform. So it's basically, we're targeting zillion different devices. So as such, we need a underlying part of the stack, something that's easy to port and, and implement on different on different platforms. So portability, uh, security. Security is also important because um, unlike some other Java solutions, um, Android outsources its security down to Linux. So like, for example, J2ME or Java ME uh, tends to do more of a security in the Java layer. And that's not the case with the Android system. We basically push the security down to Linux, which is good because Linux we know much more about uh, than Java. So, so those are some, some reasons uh, for Linux as the, the bottom of it all. Um, Linux kernel itself technically is not part of the Android project, and technically it's not a modified version of Linux. In practice, it is slightly modified, but it's based on, you know, 2.6, 30, 34, I think now. Uh, so it's more or less, it's a standard kernel. It's just that we use it to build on top of. And it's been modified for various... Uh, things we can, you know, toward Thursday, Friday, we can talk more about the internals if, if that's, you know, if you guys care about that. But I can show you uh, some of those modifications. Does the intro rely on the D-Bus? On the what? D-Bus. D-Bus? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, in, I don't know. You're right now, the, the D-Bus is more as a IPC mechanism. So I mean Android so Android has its own uh, IPC me mechanism using the binder. So there is a proprietary mechanism developed for Android. Yeah, most of the device driver right now is going to support the Right. So let's say if you have a uh, USB device and you get plug in and if your application listen on the uh, bus uh, you get zero. Let's say if you put in the USB hard drive, if your application will will know about that if the resource is coming in. And something like the uh, USB camera, if you have something like I am application, if you put in the camera, I am will know about that. Yeah. So it's that's why I don't know that's an end drive without and some of the things that were given when it is kind of the feature from the yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not familiar about that. I, I don't really know. So, a lot of that is not even exposed, such as USB is not even exposed to the Android, uh, um, you know, higher la layers. So, it, it's kept in the sort of the proprietary part of Linux. Some some of that stuff, specifically USB, for now. Um, 
Any other questions on Linux? So theoretically, any Linux system can run Android, is correct? Can any Linux system run Android? Not really. Not really. There's um, there's quite a bit of uh, specifics uh, with respect to Android. For example, uh, user management. The, the, there's no password file, right? So users are uh, actually hard coded in a C file. Um, the file system is mounted differently. It's there's no FS tab file, right? So it's mounted by um, um, in it the process so so there's it's quite different everything around the kernel is different other than the kernel itself right so so it's quite different the way it uses Linux it's based on Linux but it's not um, you know it's not any standard Linux distribution that you, you may be familiar with so Intel is using the Phoenix file system yeah. Um, it's not you well it's not using the standard it's, uh, it's not ESP2, ESP, kind of no it's it's a different file system so it's more a user space file system yes it's more of a user space file system it uh, yeah so they're using the fuse or something like that a what fuse, I'm not sure not sure if you yeah I don't exactly know how that works so, um, so the entire stack is more or less uh, licensed under uh, Apache and MIT licenses, because remember one of the one of the goals of the project was that you know it's going to be a platform that many many people are going to use for many many different devices. So as such, the license needed to be friendly for companies such as Cisco where you would take this platform and you would build on top of it and make changes to it. So regular GPL as a license doesn't quite work in that case, right? However, you know, we are using the kernel, so that's partially why kernel is a separate project uh, that, that Android builds on top of, um, which is GPL, right? But there are some licenses which are GPL or L LGPL, but for the most, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag of stuff but for the most part, it's uh, Apache, MIT type of license, BSD, and so on. So. What is the enjoy that a hardware requirement, such as what kind of CP, they can support any part of CP or only limited by the ARM process? Or um, so in terms of the CPU support, um, the, the, the idea is that a lot of stuff uh, has been designed with portability in mind. That's in theory, right? So in theory, it should be easy to port it to MIPS or to, to Intel and so on. In practice, you, you know, they're more pragmatic. They, they built, built it for a specific platform, right? So when it comes to porting to a, to, to a different chipset, uh, you would basically have to take, you know, all the libraries and rec recompile them. Uh, Dalvik in itself uh, comes in two flavors, and we'll talk about Dalvik, but there's basically a, uh, a flavor that is more of a sort of NCC, fairly portable, right? And then there's a flavor that's optimized for ARM. So, but you would probably have to do some work in porting it to a different chipset, right? So, um, in terms of the minimum requirement, um, that it, it really depends. For example, um, ginger, uh, gingerbread, the new version that's coming out, does require one gigahertz as, as sort of a minimum requirement. But that's not... Not to say that you know you can't port it to something else. It's just that it's been designed to work with that in mind, right? So we do have you know Gingerbread and Froyo running on, especially specifically Froyo running on a very old devices on which it's not supported, but it's po possible to port. So, but then you're sort of on your own when it comes to port port portability and all that. Any other questions, Linux? I'll get back to that. So on top of Linux, basically what we have is we have a bunch of native libraries, meaning C, C++ code, that is more or less copy-pasted from other open source projects. Right? So we have other projects um, that we, ne we needed to complete the whole stack. Right? So uh, to, to, for example, to, to build an you know, entire system, we needed a database. So we got SQLite database. Um, as, a, as a default database. We needed a, a way to render HTML, so we got WebKit, which is the same engine as uh, Chrome and Safari and many other browsers. Um, SSL, SGL, OpenGL, um, you know, various media codecs, things of that nature. 
So, so that's uh, mostly, you know, borrowed from the other projects. You said those set of the library, is it minimum requirement for engine model? These libraries are minimum requirement. So first of all, keep in mind that you know the examples that I took here are mostly for just educational purposes. This is not the finite. There's much larger list. So that's uh, that's the first thing. Now, what it means to be a minimum requirement? So that's that's a whole question of fragmentation of Android. What does what does it really mean to be a valid Android device, right? Because I can take Android and can strip it down and use it, for example, for you know home control system or something like that, right? Um, so that's where um, the Android team just recently uh, came up with the um, Android co compatibility um, certification. I forget exactly what it's called, um, but basically that boils down to um, to you certifying yourself or your code that it's a valid Android system right and what that means is that y there's a battery of tests that you run yourself that's going to check that there are things that a user would typically expect of an android device right um so that would check existence of you know the default codecs the default database the default this and that Th that's a part one of the test part two is more more subjective sort of like you testing that it as a, that as a user it feels like that. So in other words, you could take Android, you could modify it for some totally different use, like you know, home automation system. Or I work with a company that's using it for car, for for dashboard, right? Nothing to do with a mobile experience. So of course they strip it down and modify it, but that's fine. They just don't need to call it Android. Nobody ever even cares that it's an Android s subsystem. Um, so so that's what compatibility. So you just if you are going to call it an Android system, it should adhere to certain minimum sort of set of functionality. Make sense? Cool. Uh, any other questions to native libraries? One, one thing that you may not, uh, you may or may not have noticed is Bionic. Um, so that's basically uh, more or less an alternative version of libc library. Okay, so it's it's a modified, rewritten version of of libc. Um, it's been optimized first of all for Android. So there's some things that are added to support um, Android uh, features, such as like logging, so that there's a common logging fl framework throughout the system. Uh, but also another reason for Bionic is again the license. So Bionic is, I think, derivative of BSD. So it's licensed under those terms, which means you know you can build on top of it and you get to keep the changes, unlike L uh, LGPL. So for, for the regular license. So so that's um, we'll we'll see that when we talk about the internals later on. Cool. Okay. So. Uh, what we have next is we have something called Dalvik. Uh, so Dalvik is basically the replacement virtual machine. It's an alternative virtual machine for Android. Uh, is everyone familiar with how Java works with the, its virtual machine? Right. So basically, uh, the, the, the Android team, one of the very first things that they looked at, they're like, okay, so if we're going to use... Java as a language, um, Java as a language is free, Java tools are free, Java compilers are free, but virtual machine it's not, right? So typically if you're using the virtual machine you have to license it from Sun now Oracle, right? Um, so that didn't really work well with the, with the whole goal of having it run everywhere by many, many different companies and, and the individuals and so on. So that's why they sort of bit the bullet and decided to create a virtual machine that's specific to Android. And while they were working on that, so, you know, one reason is basically a license again. But the second reason is um, they looked at JVM in Java Virtual Machine. It's been sort of one size fits all for everything from small devices to very large servers, right? And like I said, most of the new development in Java has been more on the server side, not so much on the dev tiny little battery power device side. So they felt that they, if they focus on just the mobile experience, that they can make a virtual machine that's much better, better performing. And as such, they basically looked at uh, a, um, you know, the mobile experience and they said, what are the things that are not going to change anytime soon? soon? What are the constraints that we're sort of dealing with? And they came up with basically two things. Uh, you know, devices are going to be small, meaning underpowered. 
and they're gonna run on batteries and batteries are not gonna get much better anytime soon right we're seeing an evolution in batteries but not an evolution right or not a revolution right so so Dalvik has been optimized with with that in mind so you'll see later on but it's a very very tiny footprint virtual machine and that sort of um, goes back to remember how we outsource security down to Linux so essentially we're gonna run every single application on its own Dalvik virtual machine so unlike Unlike regular Java ME solution where you have many, many apps in the same VM space, we don't do that. We have a single process with a single Dalvik VM. So if something blows up, it's just that Linux process that blew up. Nothing else, you know. Uh, so that's where Linux is sort of managing the security. Linux is managing process processes, all that sort of stuff. So um, we'll, we'll talk more about that um, a little later. Uh, Dalvik is now uh, JIT enabled, meaning it's got just-in-time compiler. Is everyone familiar how that works? The just-in-time compilers, like a hot hotspot in Java, so you you cache the code that you interpret on the fly, right? So it makes it. it the the end result is the code now runs two to five times faster with Dalvik when it actually has some running code. Um, so that's that's a little bit about Dalvik. Any ideas why I picked uh, this picture? Other than it's a nice picture. Yeah, it's a, in Iceland. Yeah, so that's Dalvik. It's it looks like that. It's got a church. That's about it. Um, and um, so the the guy who wrote Dalvik, um, his name is Dan Bornstein. He works at Google. Um, me and him have live in the same San Francisco building. It's a five people building. I mean, it's small. I don't live there, but uh, we used to have an office at the bottom floor, so I still own the, the property. So it's totally a coincidence, a small world. I had no idea. Like, So I was like, hey, you do Android too? Huh? Interesting. So, But he basically wrote it. So, um, is it there is design for the multi-core system? Let's say if you, are, you have a multi-core CPU, they run as each Java is going to run on the Java applications per um, so, so basically, how is Dalvik gonna handle the the, the threads? Um, you know, right now, it just does time slicing, um, but um, I don't know what's coming out. Um, I don't know yet uh, with the details. Dalvik team usually works like two releases out. So they don't even work on gingerbread, they're working on honeycomb, so they're like working far out. Um, but I honestly don't know what their priorities are. I would imagine that porting to Intel uh, is one of them. So they just got JIT out, which was a big deal, right? Um, so the next big deal would be to, to get Intel version out. And one of the big, big motivations for Intel version is the Google TV, right? So that's something that, I, but this is again, I'm just speculating. I don't have the details. Um, keep in mind that, first of all, you guys are part of the alliance, right? The Open Handset Alliance. So sometimes you have a preview of the of the stuff before general public. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is sometimes code is actually in there, but it's just disabled. So for example, uh, the JIT compiler was in um, in uh, Froyo, uh, not uh, not in Froyo, but even even earlier in Android, it just it was commented out. But it was there in the code. It just, they, you know, it was just kind of turned off because they were still testing it. So, um, so that. But I would expect that that's one of the high priority items: multi support for multi-core. Yeah. Because the, even the ARM processor, the Magwell, can come up with a free, free ARM processor also, free ARM core. Yeah. And they were used for the Android and the mobile device or the Google TV. So if there is able to say we render a single process. Yes. How they are going to take advantage of other four. Yes. It's very different than the, I mean, JVM before. JVM is the one that you can run the multiple Java application on the top. Why not just run one application per within the one, I mean, virtual machine is very different. Yeah, exactly. So the VM itself needs to take advantage, yeah. do a better job at, at yeah, concurrency. Better. Yeah. Yeah, right now it doesn't, I mean, you know, we run it in the emulator, but I run it on a multi-core machine within the emulator, and it doesn't take advantage of the cores. Mm -hmm. So it just basically runs on one or the other. So yeah, step by step. Exactly. 
Yeah, we'll look at some tools how we can actually measure the execution so we can actually see how that's working. But you, you're going to see that time is just time sliced right now. So, yeah. Um, any other questions on Dalvik? No. Okay, so at the top of that, we have the app framework. So application framework is that sort of rich environment on top of which we're going to run everything, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's written in Java, but it ducktails into C code. Um, it provides easy access to a lot of features that are, you know, maybe more convoluted down below. So, for example, if I wanted to find out my location or Wi-Fi networks or get on the Internet or make a phone call or whatnot, um, App Framework makes li that very, very simple by providing a nice, con a consistent Java interface. Uh, so that's what it is. That's the part of the system that's very well documented, explained, understood, and all that. So that's sort of the new stuff. Um, whereas sort of stuff that's below this line, you know, the source code is the documentation. You know, there's not a lot of documentation other than that. So, but stuff above this part we sort of have much better understanding of. Cool. And then on top of that we have um, apps, right? So we write applications. Um, now what an application is, is roughly a, um, it's a single file, it's called an APK file. And that APK file is more or less a zip file, right? So it's basically just a, an archive of stuff. So the stuff that you get in that archive is sort of two things. I kind of have three here, but it's more or less two. So you have some Dalvik executable, meaning this is the Java code that you write, right? It gets compiled to Dalvik. We'll talk about that in a second. But that's basically the executable code. And then on top of, uh, uh, in addition to that, we have resources. So resources is everything that your app needs that is not code. So what would be some some things that your app needs that is not code? Images, icons. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of XML. So, there's going to be a lot of layouts. You'll see how you describe UI using XML. So, there's going to be quite a bit of XML code. Um, all the text, all the English is going to be more or less in XML. Right? So, we're going to outsource all that from Java to XML. So, you'll, you'll see how this ends up being uh, a lot of sort of other stuff. It doesn't you don't necessarily want to pollute your Java code with so um, we'll talk about that um, so those two things essentially make your uh, APK file now I I put native libs uh, here just because uh, you know I this is not very typical to have any native libraries as part of your application but I tend to work with companies that always want to add some you know secret sauce that's written in C or something as part of their application so that's why I kind of put it there yes you can have some native libraries as part of that and we can talk about the NDK which is the native development kit which is used for that sort of stuff uh, later on but it's not uh, a typical thing that a normal app developer would do it's just that I assume you know you guys the type of stuff you guys do sometimes you need to uh, deal with that um, so basically that's you know APK is basically Dalvik uh, code plus your resources. Um, apps must be signed, so each application um, you you got to sign it. Um, now in the development mode, which is what we're going to be doing, it's going to be implicitly signed with something called a debug key. So you're not going to have to like actually go and you know sign it. So just get signed by itself automatically. And another thing that I wanted to mention: many different markets, many different policies. Uh, so unlike um, iPhone, Blackberry, Brew, some other in, uh, ecosystems like that, where you sort of have the market, where you you know you got to get approved to get in, and that's the only place to get the distribution from. Um, Android sort of has a multiple markets. So one big one is the Android market run by Google, right? But um, but there are other markets. So I know Cisco is, for example, working on you know or wants to work on an enterprise market uh, app market, right? which is going to be sort of probably higher quality applications, right, than your typical Android market. Um, uh, the U.S. government also is working on something like that. You know, T-Mobile, many carriers have their own markets, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a different sort of uh, system than other ecosystems. It's much more democratic sort of or distributed, open, I guess.
So, um, so that's basically that. Any questions on apps? Okay. So then let's talk a little bit about uh, Java in Android. So I just want to point out a couple of things, a couple of differences. So as you know, in normal Java code, you write Java source code, you compile it, and you get Java bytecode, right? This is your dot class. And then you put that dot class file on top of JVM, and that's where it runs, right? With Android, it's slightly different. So we still write the very same Java code. We still compile it with the very same Java C compiler. We still get the very same dot class file. But then we recompile it once again to get the .dx file or dot or .dex file or Dalvik executable, and it's that file that we now run on top of the Dalvik virtual machine. So that's where sort of it's different. So these these steps are sort of additional. Okay, it looks like uh, you know more work, but you'll see how tools just make this automatic. So you're not going to see these extra steps. It just happens. Um, quick question for you. A um, couple of questions. Why why Java? Why why use Java? Why not C, which is you know what everyone writes embedded code in, or why not you know some more um, you know modern language like Ruby or Python or something like that? If you were creating a system like this. Yeah, exactly. There are a ton of Java developers. That's, I think, the number one reason. Because Android was really not designed for the embedded developers. It wasn't designed for you guys, right? It was designed for all those kids who were writing PHP and other Java web applications up, up until recently now want to do something new and cool, right? So that's sort of, it's a much, much more of a mass market appeal. Um, and Java is a decent language for that. May not be the ideal best language in the world, but it's okay, and right. So given everything else, it's a good, well-rounded language. So that's that's a good reason. Um, so can we still write C applications? Can you so can you write C applications on Android? So uh, yes, you can. But what do you mean by application? Is it a, as a, as in an Android application or just a Linux application? It's going to run on C. So here's, here's the thing. Um, I usually answer that question on d depending on who you are, right? So you can wear two hats. You can be an app developer or you can be a platform developer. Platform developer means you're shipping a new version of Android. And then you're God. You can do whatever you want. You can write new C code. You can install it. You know, you're modifying the entire operating system, right? If you're an app developer, then... Um, Dalvik is the king, so everything is going to run on top of Dalvik. So that means it's going to be Java. But you can also write C code that's going to run as part of your application. But it's still going to run within Dalvik. So that's where NDK sort of comes comes in handy. Sort of like JNI in Java, right? So yes, you, you can have native C, C++ object code, but keep in mind that it's running on top of the JVM. Uh, so JVM is loading it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's still constrained by the same restrictions that the JVM is. Same thing, so there would be some performance. Yes. Yeah. There would be some performance uh, differences, and and sometimes ten, you know, order of a magnitude performance in, in differences. I usually do this example with the Fibonacci no, uh, sequence, and uh, we do it both in C and Java, and then measure the difference, and it's about tenfold. Wow. Yeah. So, um, but you know, and and it keeps the same even if you do it iteratively or recursively. So it's kind of interesting, you know, in terms of performance. So yeah, so that's the main motivation for having a native code is to you know have some pieces of your code that otherwise need to be running faster. Yeah. Um, Another question: Why didn't we Why didn't we go from Java source code then directly to Dalvik? Why Why do these extra steps? Yeah, that's a that's a really good idea. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we inherit from Java bytecode is that you can then compile other code down to Java bytecode. So, for example, I said Ruby or Python, right? So they can both compile to Java bytecode, 
So Java bytecode tends to be a very good runtime environment, right? For many modern interpreted languages. So JPython, JRuby, as I mentioned, um, are some examples. So, so that's that's uh, that's a good reason um, as well. Another reason is, uh, you know, Java compiler already does a lot of useful stuff. So we're basically just inheriting where it, we left off, right? So in that way, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel that J Java C already does. So that's another reason. Um, but when I spoke with the Google team, why they did it this way, um, their main reason this, for this choice was that um, back when they started this project was 2005. And that's when Java was going through a major change. That's when Java 5 came out. So in other words, this was changing, right? So they couldn't base Dalvik on something that was so in flux. So that's why they decided to base it on the on the bytecode, for the most part. Make sense? So far so good on that? Okay, so let me just kind of point this out. Um, so as you know, um, Java comes in different packages, right? So we have Java ME for mobile edition, Java SC standard edition, we have desktop Java, and then Java EE, Java Enterprise Edition, right? So Android is neither of those, right? It's not any of the standard three Java packaging. Um, the easiest way to kind of think about it is that we started with the standard edition Java. We took out anything that has to do with UI. So AWT and Swing. Anybody did AWT Swing work? A little bit, okay. So that's gone, right? So that stuff is gone, but that's been replaced with a bunch of Android-specific APIs. So this is basically the app framework plus replacement for UI++, plus plus, right? So a bunch of other stuff. There's some other things that are taken out of AWT and Swing. I think um, um, Reflection and a couple of minor things like that. But, but you know, those are sort of auxiliary things. The, I think AWT and Swing is sort of the biggest different so the UI is is quite different but the reason why this you know this is sort of important is because you're gonna be asking questions like you know oh, what about Android networking or what about Android IO or what about Android threading well those things are the same as in Java so not none of that has changed right so you know, you want to open up a file, it's the same as you open up, uh, open it up in Java. You want to open up a, a socket, uh, it's the same as in Java. So, so those things haven't changed. There may be some other support on top of it, but for the most part, it's the same as in regular Java. Okay? So that's why I kind of wanted to point that out. Any other questions on that? Java, make sense? Cool. So let's um, let's then talk a little bit about uh, the setup. So how many of you have set up the environment? Okay. Does anybody not have it set up? And uh, are you guys using virtual machine or have it natively? Uh, machine. Virtual machine. Okay. Virtual. Yeah, both. Okay. If anybody wants, a, I have the virtual machine and a USB key. I can just pass it on to you. So let me know if anybody needs it. Um, you guys know the advantages, disadvantages of running it natively. So in virtual machine, it's the, the advantage is I pre-configured everything for you. You can just set it up and run with it. Um, and, um, and that's about it, right? It's pretty quick to set up. Uh, the downside is that, A, it's based on Ubuntu, right? So some people are not familiar with the Ubuntu environment. Um, and I can't legally distribute Windows, unfortunately. Um, and... Sometimes it runs slower when you run it inside the virtual machine. So it's just kind of like a preference. Some people like it one way or the other. Um, the reason why we um, we have the virtual machine is because, you know, when I do short classes, then it becomes really hard to set up everyone's environment. Everyone's on a different system. And, and plus setting up Android is a... Uh, um, the, the, there's a second... There are two-part... Ste two steps, right? So first of all, for SDK, you need to set up SDK shell, then you need to download the platform, right? So that means that in the class where I have, you know, 10, 20 people, when everyone goes to do the second part, which they have to do, you know, then and there, it just clogs the network and runs slow and will waste a lot of time. Uh, similarly with Eclipse, it's a two-stage 
setup. You download Eclipse, and then you download the tools for Eclipse. So that always makes it really hard to do it in a class. Um, I have attempted to, uh, well, we, not me particularly, but somebody in the company, uh, we've attempted to make setup much easier. So we actually, for native setup, so w without the virtual machine, so we actually now have a developing environment which is a pre-configured Eclipse and pre-configured um, 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 SDK. So as opposed to having to do the second stage for every single one of them and, and take time, we have pre-downloaded that and repackaged it. So if anybody wants it, I have it for Linux, Mac, on, and Windows as a, as a different environment. So just so you know. Um, it's on the USB key, so it's, you're welcome to, uh, to use it. Um, now, let me walk you guys through the, uh, through the um, SDK and kind of explain it. So, you install the SDK, you have a directory, something like Android SDK or something like that, right? So, inside of the directory, you're going to have a bunch of subdirectories. Um, there's going to be one called tools and tools is a directory where a lot of common SDK tools go into okay it's highly recommended that this particular directory you put in your path everyone knows what I mean by that right in your environment path right are you, are you guys on Windows or, are you, or, or are you on Linux windows, mostly Windows Mac. Mac okay Mac Mac okay okay any, so nobody's on Linux a couple of you are on virtual machine yeah Okay, so and you you're quite you're okay with Ubuntu and all that. Okay, perfect, cool. So, okay, it's uh, for the most part things are the same. I'll point it out where where it's it's not, but for the most part everything we do we're agnostic to the actual platform. Um, so tools is where your tools are. So put that in the path. Um, we're gonna be seeing some of these tools as we keep on going, uh, and we'll see them as they make sense. So we're not gonna see them right away. But I'll point them out as they make sense. Now, the next directory that is very important is the directory called platforms. And inside of platforms, you're going to have any number of different subdirectories. Uh, what platforms is is where you plug in a specific platform you're working on. Okay. So remember, I said it's a two-stage download. So before it used to be very simple when we had Android 1.0. You just download SDK and you have everything. 1.1, you go download SDK and you have everything. And then they noticed, hey, we're repeating a lot of stuff. There's stuff that's common, right? So that, so then they came up with basically the shell of the SDK in which you plug in different platform, right? So right now I have two platforms. I have Android 4, 4 and Android 8, meaning I have Android 1.6, aka Donut, Right? And Android 8, 8 aka Froyo, aka 2.2. And that's totally fine, yes. On the VM, what I did is I, tr I worked really hard to make it as small as possible, and that's why um, you, know, you only need one platform. It doesn't really matter which one we work with. Uh, so as long as you have one, I don't really care about anything else. So that's why, that's fine. Um, did you guys download the 1.5 gig or the 9 gig of virtual machine? Two, uh, virtual machine 1 or virtual machine 2? Okay, how big was it? How, how big? Okay. okay, that's fine. So you basically download, so let me explain that. I have two versions of virtual machine. And the only difference is that the bigger one, which is what you have, also contains the source code for the entire Android platform. That's because I use it for the internals training as well, when we actually built from scratch the entire platform, right? Um, and the source code for Android is about 2.3 gigs on it by itself. Plus, there's a bunch of other stuff that comes with it. So that's why it's a little bloated that virtual machine. So that's totally fine. If you want to make it smaller, you can just blow away the directory called Froyo in your root. Um, but other than that, you know, it, it may be useful to have source code handy. So it doesn't doesn't hurt. Does the Android directory also include the index source code? Uh, which one? The Android directory, does it include the index source code? When you build, does it build everything or does it build Android? 
when you build the uh, the entire Android, it actually contains everything, including the SDK, the NDK, the Eclipse tools, uh, basically the, the entire... The kernel, right? Yeah, except the kernel is part of the pre-built packages. So it does contain kernel, but in a binary format. Right, so the kernel itself is part of the pre-built packages, yeah. But if we have a new driver, let's say if we have a driver for Android, it will be part of this platform? Yes, you, there's a place for you to put that driver in, yes, you could plug it in. Yeah, and then when you build it, you can build for different targets. So you can say, I'm building for CS, or building for generic, which will be emulator, and so on. So you can kind of configure what you're building for. Um, so inside of these platforms, again, it doesn't matter which one you have, as long as you have at least one. Um, so there's a um, couple of subdirectories as well. Uh, one is tools, which is the platform-specific tools. Don't worry about that too much. That's going to be done used automatically. Um, there's a platform for skins, which is basically the, sk the skin is the look and feel of a, a device in the emulator. So, I, do you guys have a skin for a CS? Anybody knows? The look and feel for CS? So, basically, what the skin is, it, it you know, it's kind of like this is what the phone looks like. It's got 1024 by 768, and it's got buttons at the bottom, right? So, that sort of stuff. So, I'm, I'm sure somebody somewhere has created uh, a skin for CS. But these are some default ones. Um, and then one directory that's actually very important in platforms is this directory called images. Okay, um, and images is not graphics. Images is basically the file system images. Okay, um, so uh, you technically have three files. Two of them are important. System.img represents the entire Android system when it's built. Okay. So it's usually about 50, 60, 80 megs of stuff. But this is essentially what the system partition on your device looks like. This is the equivalent of like, you know, C column backslash Windows on your Windows, right? So it is the entire f operating system. Everything is in there in binary format built, right? User data corresponds to the user partition. So it's usually much smaller. It's a couple of megs, right? And then it keeps growing, right? And then RAM disk is tiny. It's it's uh, just a RAM disk. And this is the kernel for QEMU, which is the emulator that we're going to use. So I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, so that's all you kind of care about um, in terms of the uh, platforms, right? So as I said, each each um, platform you download is going to have a different directory here. Now, are you guys familiar with the, um, just version numbers, what it means Android 8 versus Android 2.2? No? Uh, yeah, can you explain that? Yeah, let me, um, let me, um, yeah, I'm going to use, I, I, I used to have that slide, but I took it out, but I moved it to a different place. So, this is what that really means. So we are all f familiar with these versions, right? 1.0, 1.1, 1 1.5, 1 6, and so on and so on, right? And you guys are, you've heard of nicknames, right? It started, it was gonna, when they started nicknaming versions, they were gonna call them after robots. So the first one was Android, but then they couldn't come up with a B. So they switched to pastries, right? So that's why we now then have Cupcake, Donut, Eclair, 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 Froyo for frozen yog yogurt, and the next one is gingerbread. gingerbread, and so on and so on, right? So it goes alphabetically, and it's something that's yummy, usually. So, um, so those are nicknames. Now, the most important type of a number is this number, API level. And what API level is, is the capabilities of the platform, right? So for example, you know, was there version 1.7, 1.8, 1.9? 1 .9? Probably. Did we care about it? Probably not, because it was uh, most likely just bug fixes, performance improvements, etc. In other words, there was no new, there was no changes to the API. So you as an app developer don't really care. The API stayed the same. But whenever API changes, even slightly, this number gets jacked up by one. Right. So we're right now at API level 8, which corresponds to Android 2.2, which is nicknamed frozen yogurt, right?
Yeah. Yes. So everything is backwards compatible. Um, they they may deprecate some code, which is basically marking it for, you know, don't use it. But but yeah. When you create an um, Android project in Eclipse, you select the API level or mm -hmm. Android version. But then at the bottom it asks you for the minimum version. So why would you choose a different minimum version? Like why do they have that when you are already saying that oh, I'm you know using. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I'll I'll talk about it more um, later. But um, let's kind of take a look at the distribution. And this slide is slightly old. Uh, this is July first. Keeps changing all the time. This is I did something. I, I did a presentation for your upper management for Barry's team. Um, so it's the data from back then. But the the you know here's the distribution. Basically, a third of people are still stuck at 1.5, and and you know, so basically, about half people are still running 1.5, 1.6, 1 right? So now, you when you're writing an application, you know, it's up to you. Do you want to care about this other millions of people or not, right? So, in other words, you may say, look, I want to take advantage of the latest greatest things in Froya, right? But I would also like to have a large market share right so you may say in that case I'm going to design my app for Android 8 but I'm gonna support as far back as Android 4 right so for example if that if a certain feature is not available because user is running old version of Android you can gracefully scale down to that version you can disable a single button or single feature in your app as opposed to not have the app run at all right it's kind of like you know you you know the latest windows software may be designed for windows 7 but it's going to run as on as as far back as windows i don't know 95 or something right so you want to you want to gracefully scale down right for example bluetooth doesn't exist up, uh, up until version 5 so um, you know, I may basically just disable support for Bluetooth devices in my app for all their versions. But my app is still going to run, minus that one feature. So that's that's the reason why that exists. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are getting updates. So let me show you this. And again, it's dated, but the picture is um, is... is interesting. So see how people are still... a lot of people are still stuck more or less on 1.5 a lot of people are still stuck more or less on 1.6 this is kind of they're getting squeezed out but not fast enough compared to like like 2.1 almost nobody's running on 2.1 anymore we just new release bam everyone got updated right so in similar for 2.2 new release bam people really quickly get updated the thing is so you know, new releases get pushed to users via over-the-air updates, right? Now, all the devices, the, fir the firmware simply doesn't support that. So, for example, HTC sold millions of G1 devices, right? But they're not capable of 2x Android. And HTC is working so, is so busy with, like, new products, they don't have time to deal with the old stuff. They're just not motivated to deal with that. So that's why, and you know, and the way it works in America is you buy a phone under a two-year contract. So basically, these people here, they're stuck for two years, right? That's why this line kind of is going out slowly. Okay. You cannot install new, like 2.2 based on the G1 phone? So it's not, uh, can you uh, install it? Um, you can, we've done it in the office. We have Gingerbread, um, sorry, Froyo running on the oldest phone, G1. Um, it's not supported, it runs really sluggishly, right? And it's not an official release, so, but yes. So the it's reason you want to upgrade to the Android from 1 to 2.0 because you try to run more application? Well, 2.0 just has more capabilities. Right, so for example, everyone now wants to get to 2.2 because it's got just-in-time compiler, making your code two to five times faster. Um, so everyone wants the latest greatest, right? Um, now, f when Gingerbread comes out, you know, one gigahertz is sort of the minimum, 
So even if you have an older droid or something like that, it may run sluggishly or not even be supported by the manufacturer. Right. So there is the open source Android, but then there is a layer that each manufacturer needs to provide, which is basically all the drivers and everything, right? So uh, you know we do depend on on manufacturers to actually roll out the firmware updates as well. Yeah. The uh, the OS update those are pushed by the manufacturer or by Google? Uh, no, they're pushed by the carrier. The carrier. So in te technically, it's pushed by the carrier, but the carrier works very closely with manufacturer um, to to get those updates. Not necessarily with Google. So Google is sort of working on the open source version of it, and they may work closely with a couple of manufacturers to sort of you know get it right on their devices. Just being pragmatic, but Google in itself is not really it's not their job to push the updates other than for Nexus one and the phones that they support. Yeah. So, so that's sort of how that that works. What is the major difference between Android one zero and Android two point zero? Just the running fast. Um. Well, the capabilities of the API keep changing all the time. So there's new features all the time, right? Um. Better support for this. Better support for that. So. It is also the application oriented. Some of the can run over the iPhone. Uh, well, so, yeah, so certain applications could be taking advantage of certain things that are only available in the latest version. So they may or may not be able to run on the older versions. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So let's do, uh, so now that we kind of talked about all the uh, bits and pieces of the SDK, let's do a simple um, application Hello World just to kind of Test that you guys have everything working, and uh, you know set it up and kind of go from there. So, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up Eclipse, and uh, let me see if I have any previous Hello Cisco projects. Let me delete. So we're gonna create a new project. So uh, go to File, New, Android Project. If you do not have Android project available there, you probably did not install Android tools for Eclipse, ADT. Otherwise, if everything works, if, you, if your Eclipse so far is configured properly, you should have a window like this. It's called the new Android project. Oh, by the way, uh, one directory I did not mention. So, um, just back in SDK, there's another directory called add-ons. Okay. Uh, so, add-ons is basically very similar to platforms, except it's the third-party releases of Android. So, what does that mean? So, for example, um, you guys may have a different version of Android for CS. You're likely going to have that, right? You're going to have a modified version of Android that's going to support some special stuff, right? Maybe there's like, you know, licensing support, like some, something, some special sauce that, that you created. Um, and you, you may want to roll it out to developers so the developers can develop for your version of CS. Okay, so what you would do then is you would release an add-on, right? So these are, you know, just some add-ons that I kind of made up um, here. But one, one, one common add-on that's well known is, for example, Google add-on for, for Android. So, for example, yes, Google does have the team that works on the open source Android, but then they also have a team that works on a proprietary version of Android. So when you get a phone with from T-Mobile or somebody and it says with Google on it, you likely have a, a, a different version of Android, a non-open source version, a commercial version of Android. What's the, difference? What's the difference? So it's got Google's secret sauce, for example, Google Maps, right? Um, so that, that's one thing that's not open source, right? Google uh, App Market is not open source. So in other words, if you want to have an Android that has certain things pre-configured, pre-installed, certain libraries, installed uh, such as you know navigation 
and so on, then you need a different version of Android. Does it mean you need a bigger road? Or? Yes, so it means that it's licensed. Now, you, you know, it's, we indirectly pay to our carrier. I pay to T-Mobile. T-Mobile then has some licensing agreement with, uh, with Google and so on. But that's a pretty common situation. So almost nobody runs a vanilla Android out of out of you know the the, the um, uh, carriers. So carriers work in the in, in the states at least. Carriers carriers work very closely with OEMs to create proprietary versions, right? So HTC is probably in, in my mind the best example. So HTC has their whole Sense UI. So you've seen their phones; they look much sexier. Than a regular Android phone, right? The apps are nice and flashy, and it's very much like an iPhone experience. So that's the kind of work that HTC does. So they take regular Android, they build on top of it, right? And then that's what they provide to carriers. So when you're writing an app, you're actually doing the add-ons from all the vendors to test on it. Well, you you can if you want. You don't technically need it. You only need it if you're using that carrier's extra. So, for example, unless I'm writing an app that needs that is using Google Maps, I don't care about Google Maps API. So, in that case, I would just write for standard Android platform. And most of the work I do, I just write for the standard Android platform. But if, for example, and and for example, HTC may not ever want to release their libraries to other developers because they're just not concerned about other developers writing special stuff based on HTC stuff. But, for example, maybe, uh, um, maybe C uh, Cisco has added support for multi-users to CS, which is something that you guys are interested in, right? So support, support multiple users so I can actually log in into the device, mm -hmm. right? So if there is something like that and I want to develop apps that take advantage of multi-user system, then I would expect Cisco to deliver libraries to me. And those libraries would be in the form of a of an add-on. So if you take Google, let's. This is API you have here right now. I mean, we don't seem to have it in the room, but we start to work here with Cisco API. Well, these APIs here? The Cisco API that you have. On the oh, this is a Cisco API. I just made it up. Oh. Uh, these are all. I, I was just doing an example. What it would take to to. But what what would it take for you to create a new add-on? How hard is that? So basically. Uh, you know, let's take a look at the add-on. So add-on, you know, okay, yes, you, you may provide some documentation, you may provide some sample code, that's not that important. But ultimately, you may have some libraries. So for example, I said, yeah, I copied probably the Google on, so there's a jar file with some secret sauce that I as a developer would need to link against, right? Um, but ultimately, the most important thing is going to be another version of system image. Right? So, um, what you would do to create a new version is you would go, if you're on a virtual machine, you go to that directory called Froyo, you would type make. You would sit back and relax for about six to eight hours. Okay, and that would produce the new version. That would compile the source code for the entire platform, the result of which would be system.img. So this is now a brand new version of Android that gets flashed onto the device. But for a developer, you can also include it this way so the developer can develop against that. Right? So that's what that is, add-on. Cool. Um, so, and, and you guys don't have it, but again, it's not that important for now. Don't worry about it at all. You can, if you wanted to download it, I'll show you later on how to do it. Um, so back to this directory. So I just want to do a, a quick hello Cisco project. So that's a project name. So the project name is a um, just an Eclipse construct. Eclipse organizes everything in projects. Then you need to pick the target. In other words, what you're building this project for. And what I have here is the list of all target uh, uh, platforms and add-ons. It's, it's it's a union. It's a union of these two folders. Oops these two add-ons and platforms. That's why I have five things, six things. You guys have only one, right? Mm -hmm. So that's totally fine. Don't worry about that. We're going to just base everything on just Android 8 or 2.2. 2. 
So next, what, what it's asking us is for application name. Application name is just an arbitrary name. So hello, comma, space, Cisco, exclamation mark. If they if they're willing to release, yes, you would you would be able to get it from they they just need to release it. Um I don't know what they're at, what they're at with releasing that. Um I recently spoke at this, uh, uh, at a Sprint conference and I know Sprint is sort of you know, they have their own stuff and so everyone's trying to release that. Um you know, so I'm not sure how how much they're promoting that. It could be you need to sign up for the developer program. Uh, but yes, that's how they package it. Yes. But the situation, situation is getting more and more complicated. Let's say the manufacturer, the equipment provider have their own library, this kind of thing. And eventually, the carrier may have their own. Yes. So you may need to combine both and create your own matrix and then. <laughs> yes, but so you know, but then the question is, I mean, it's also uh, you know, for example, if uh, Sprint HTC, let's take those two. So if is, if Sprint has their own libraries and HTC yeah. have their own libraries, um, it, you know, the question for you as a developer is, do you want to develop something that's really dependent on both Sprint and HTC? Because they need to really give you something that highly motivates you to use it. Otherwise, why would you develop your app that only works for HTC Sprint phones as opposed to millions of other phones? So you as a developer typically want to have as wide of a reach as possible, right? So, but, of, but the vendors would like you to, to lock you in. So that's kind of like everyone's got a different goal. Okay, so next, after pack, uh, after application name, it's a package name. Package name is a Java package, and it's very important. It's going to have to, it's going to trickle down into security and signage and, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's, as such, it's very important. In Java, as you know, we typically do a reverse of, you know, your domain name. So it's with something like com Cisco hello, for instance. Uh, that's typically what the Java package name would look like. Optionally, we can create an activity. We haven't talked about what activities are quite yet, but um, it's roughly a screen. Um, and that screen is represented by a Java class. So whatever we put here is going to be a Java class name, right? So it needs to be, you know, for example, hello, Cisco. So capital H, capital C, right? So I'll, it, it's got that here to class names, right? It's got a standard. And then it's asking of, for a minimum SDK version, back to your uh, Veral's question about, um, you know, what that is. So in the past, um, this would just, so this number would just come right from here. So it would just take this number and copy it because they were always the same, right? But now we're realizing, hey, it doesn't have to be the same. Maybe we're targeting the latest, greatest, but supporting the older version as well, which is the, the best uh, practice. So that's why that number now is smaller, or it could be smaller, right? You hit enter, and bam, it creates a new new project for you, new, new project. And so that's basically um, where we're at. So does everyone um, have this project so far? So far, everything works so far? Okay, so because um, we're about to take a break, and I just want to uh, know if you guys have any problems with the setup, I can help you out during the break, make sure that, you know, we sort it out and kind of go from there. But then...